Okay, the last thing I want to say today is that ADP is not the last word in reinforcement learning. In ADP, we learn a model. What a pain, a transition function. I got all these questions on Piazza about, oh, how big is my array going to be? Like, ah. Uh, um, because people, it is natural. Everyone wants to like pre-allocate the transition matrix. You know, okay, fine. I'm sympathetic to that. I pre-allocate my transition matrix. But um, some people think, okay, that's expensive. If the state space has 10 million states in it, then having a, an array that's 10 million by 10 million is going to be too big. Maybe I'm implementing a little teeny, do you know every modem has a reinforcement learner in it um, that uh, learns the uh, quality of the uh, line, what the no line noise is like. And there people are, some people are like, whoa, that's just, you know, I'm not going to put that in some little embedded microprocessor, you know, an array that's like 500 gigabytes. Um, so there is this alternative called model-free reinforcement learning where you don't learn a model. It's model-free. No models have been harmed. Um, and the procedure for, for, for dealing, doing model-free reinforcement learning is called Q-learning. Um, you learn a function called Q instead of a function called U. Uh, now, we have to derive Q. So how are we going to get Q here? Uh, OK. Whew. So we really want U. U is like if we had U, we could do all the stuff we know and love. But I don't want to keep T around. So I'm going to change things a little bit. Instead of just keeping track of the value of being in a state and then doing one step look ahead, I mean, in order to do one step look ahead, if I back up, if I'm composite, if I'm capable of backing up, to do one step look ahead, to, to be greedy according to the, to the value function, I have to have t. So I need to find some way of, of computing a policy based on my experience that doesn't involve looking ahead with t. So instead of having pi of s, um, what we're going to do, instead of having u of s, we're going to have q of s a. If I do this, if I do, if I'm in the state, what's the value of taking this action? Okay, it sounds like a totally minor little tweak, but it turns out to be important. Um, now, if we decide to formulate things this way with q s a, then this transforms into this. Um, we're just shifting things a little bit. We're just taking this R and moving it off into the future. So instead of saying the value of transitioning to state, a, of acting in state S is the immediate reward plus the future, we're going to say the value of taking action A and S, we've are already in S. We don't get the reward for landing in S. Just look ahead. And we get the discounted, expected, future reward, and Reward to go if we take the best action. So this equation is just this one kind of shifted around where this R goes into the future. OK, everyone see that? Everyone's happy with this? And now the question is, how can we deal with, with this equation without T or R? This equation is the future value we should get. And it's the expected future reward given the next time step and the entire, then the future from there. Now, I don't want to store this. And I don't want to store this. So I'm not going to be able to compute this exactly in a very nice, pretty way. The last time we came up with something like this, this pair of recursive definitions, what did we do? We take inspiration from Richard Bellman. Yeah, he invented value iteration. He just said, oh, whatever, just take some random u's and then make them better. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here. We're going to take some random q's and we're going to make them better. How can we possibly make them better? Well, act in the world, dude. You're in a state, you're taking action, and stuff happens. Q should be an estimate of what's going to happen. So every time you do something, you get some data about what Q ought to be. 
right? If I'm, if I'm in S and I do A, I'm going to have a predicted Q. And then I'm actually going to experience, I'm going to have an experience, and I can compare that with my prediction. Now the prediction is, is supposed to be about expected error, so it's like averaged over lots of cases. So, when I, I, so I'm expecting that I'll get some kind of error here. So I'm not going to completely update my estimate of Q to match what happened exactly, but I'm going to move towards it. I'm going to like add in like alpha is going to be some learning rate that's less than one, that's like you know, 0.1 or something. I'll move towards making the prediction a little closer to what was sensed. So if, if my current Q is too low, then this will be too low, this will be much larger. I multiply it by a tenth, and I made this larger, teeny bit larger. So I've made Q bigger. So it'll move in the direction of, of, of matching the experience I had. What's the problem with just jumping right there? So. Well, because uh, then you'd be wrong. <laughs> uh, the, uh, you're trying to learn the expected reward. So, um, you know, like what's the probability of enjoying myself if I ask someone out from this sorority? Sometimes you have a great time, and you're like, oh, wow, my Q value will be really high. Sometimes it's really low, and you're like, oh, never going to do that again. But, you know, you should be computing an average. Right? Sometimes it's great, sometimes it's bad. Your average should be somewhere in the middle. So every time it's great, you don't want to jump right up to great, because that's not true. You need, to, you, need to, you need to respect the past. Right? You've had 5,000 experiences. Just having one, one, I'm sorry, not you necessarily. <laughs> Pretend there's an agent who's had 5,000 experiences. <laughs> I told you this lecture was all about life. Um, just, you have one more experience, you shouldn't immediately reset everything. You should like, okay, I'll adjust my average a little bit. Right? Pump it up a little bit, or bump it down a little bit. Right? Just a little bit, alpha less than one. All right. This is called Q learning. Um, so, so the sensed minus predicted. So um, this is what actually happened. Like I got some reward, um, and then I use my current. This is where it gets starts to get a little hairy. Is I'm using my bogus estimates, not just for my prediction, but also to talk about the value that <laughs> was sensed. Um, I got some reward and uh, average over what happens in the future. Um, so this is, this is the Q-learning update right here. Is that really correct? Shouldn't this be? Uh, Oh, never mind. No, this is absolutely correct. This is a, never mind. Take it back. So, this is the we were in S and we did A, and we were expecting to get a certain. We we're expecting to get a certain amount of reward. Instead, we got exactly R, and we ended up in S prime. And then we look ahead one step and we say we're in S prime. Look at all the different A primes I can do in 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 S prime. Let's take the best one. This is my estimate of the entire future reward. Multiply that by gamma, because the future is worth less than the present, and compare that to my prediction. OK, so the, the only part about this equation that's at all hokey now is this alpha. I said like 0.01, but that's a little hokey. Like should, as you have more and more experience, you should probably turn this down. Um, and um, if you want to guarantee that Q learning converges to the optimal solution, um, you need to reduce alpha in a certain way, uh, that, a way that meets certain conditions. And it happens that 1 over n, where n is the number of trials, um, the number of times you have done A in S, um, it turns out that is actually satisfies the conditions. So that's not a bad rule for updating alpha. Again, we have not taken exploration into account here at all. Um, we're assuming you'll still go with the greedy action, so you should 
somehow ameliorate that, either by trying every action in every state a certain number of times, or choosing a random action with some probability. Choosing a random action with a probability that decreases over time is also not a bad thing to do. And notice we don't have to remember T and R. There's no model in here. No, very little memory. This is a great thing to implement on like a network router that's trying to send traffic down some link and it doesn't know the congestion. So it's like, oh, which link should I send the packet down? I don't know. Let's try it. See what happens. So there's a whole thing called queue routing, uh, where you use queue learning in a router. Um, and you don't have very much state. You just have to remember a queue for every S and every A. So you don't have a whole big T clonking around. Any questions on queue learning? All right, that's reinforcement learning. There's what? Whoa, Nathan, yeah, hit me. So does the thinker go for the right? Q learning, yeah. yeah. So should we, um, we can't just do what's on this slide because we have to do also exploration? Well, that's why I say down here, choose random with probability 1 over n. That's exploration. It's a random exploration, but it's exploration. Pretty, pretty simple. If you want to do something crazy, there's something called Gittins. Oh, okay. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, yes, do what's on the slide. Okay. Absolutely. Um, there's only one more thing to say about reinforcement learning, which is how on earth would you ever do it in a like, real world problem where the state space is ginormous? Because even QSA. Right? You have for every possible state you could be in. Like vacuum world, the number of states, exponential in the number of dirts. Um, strips planning, you know, someone could feed you a domain with a zillion predicates. Either they could each be true or false of various objects. The state spaces are enormous. So how on earth, we've talked about reinforcement learning algorithms as if you could represent, like, for every state, blah. So how does that fare in the real world? Um, Matt is going to talk about that on Wednesday. I'm going to be in DC, so I can't be here. I apologize. But I'm sure Matt will be much clearer than I would be. Um, and he'll tell you the answer. So we've done solving a known MDP using value iteration. Uh, Real-time dynamic programming, policy iteration. We've done solving an, uh, an, uh, an MDP that you don't even know using approximate dynamic programming, using either value iteration or whatever you want. And then we talked about Q-learning. So Matt will talk about scaling reinforcement learning, and then we'll be done, and we'll move on to the next portion of the class. Next week will be supervised learning. <laughs>